In this video, we describe regions and polar coordinates. Um, we also convert from rectangular coordinates to polar coordinates. We've got double integrals, and we want to write them in the new coordinate system. Um, so, so here are a few regions, and let's say the problem sta this problem statement says, or, or asks us to um, describe the regions and polar coordinates. So rather than using rectangular coordinates, we want to use polar coordinates. Now remember what I said before in the last video. R, um, we, we, when we're thinking of values for R, we want to think of circles radiating out from the origin. R equals 0 is just the single point. It's the origin. R equals 1 is a circle of radius 1. R equals 2 is a circle of radius 2. So here, R starts at 0 and it goes all the way out to 3. So we're going from 0 out to 3. So r goes from 0 to 3. Now if you're saying to yourself, well, we don't get the whole circle, you're absolutely right. Theta is going to take care of the fact that we don't get that whole um, solid, uh, or not solid, but that whole disk here. Um, theta starts here and ends here. So this tells us where to start, and it tells us where, the, where to stop. Theta is an angle that sweeps around the xy plane. So it starts at this point, and then I'm trying to keep my, my end point fixed at the origin, and then it sweeps around the xy plane, <laughs> and it ends up back over here. So theta starts at 0, or that's, oh, oops, not theta. It starts at 0, and it ends over here, and that is pi plus half of pi, that's three halves of pi. Now, I want you to see how nice this is. This is so much easier, um, so much um, better and easier and cleaner um, a way to describe this region um, than the way we would describe it in rectangular coordinates. In rectangular coordinates, I'd say, okay, um, well, let's split it into two parts x goes from negative 3 to 0, while y goes from this function to this function. So y would go from a negative square root of 9 minus x squared to a positive square root of 9 minus x squared. And then over here, x would go from 0 to 3, and y would go from here to here. And on this circle, which is given by x squared plus y squared equals r squared, which is 9, if I solve that for y, I'd get y goes from 0 to the square root of 9 minus x squared there. So I would have these ugly square roots for both of the or bounds for y over here and for one of the bounds of y over there. Or I can switch to polar coordinates, and this is so nice. r just goes from 0 out to 3. So we've got those circles radiating out from the origin, going out from starting at 0 and then going out to 3 theta is an angle that sweeps around the xy plane. It starts at 0, and then it always sweeps in the counterclockwise direction to 3 pi over 2. Now this is similar, um, but r doesn't start at 0 this time. r starts at this value, so r is starting at 1, and it goes out to 2. r equals 1 is the equation of that circle, and r equals 2 is the equation of that circle. Now we don't get the entire um, washer here. We only get half of the washer. To figure out which half, well, to, or to um, define which half of the washer we get, we need to start at an angle over here, and then we have to let that angle sweep counterclockwise. Theta starts here and ends here. Well, we're told that this is the line y equals negative x. So that's splitting this, um, this quadrant right here into two pieces. This angle's got to be 45 degrees, and that angle has to be 45 degrees. So this is theta equals negative pi over 4 radians. Negative 45 degrees, or if we switch to radians, which we should because we're in calculus class, we'll call that negative pi over 4 radians. And then we go over here. And this is also 45 degrees, and that's 45 degrees. So this is 3 fourths of pi. So theta equals 3 pi over 4 radians there. So theta starts at pi, negative pi over 4 and goes to 3 pi over 4. 
If you prefer, you could call this 7 pi over 4 and do 7 pi over 4 plus 11, or um, plus pi to get to 11 pi over 4. <coughs> that would work as well. Um, this is the one I'm going to stick to, but um, as long as it only goes through, as long as you go in a counterclockwise direction, um, and you're going from one angle to an angle that's larger than that, uh, you're good. You don't want to call this 7 pi over 4 and that 3 pi over 4 because you'll have the wrong sign. Um, you'll get the wrong answer. Um, so a theta is an angle, it's increasing from this value to that value. Now this one is a little bit harder than the others um, because on the others, r was going from a constant to a constant because I had circles centered at the origin. Um, and theta was going from one value to another value as it swept across the xy plane. This one's a little harder, um, but it can be written in polar coordinates pretty easily as well. Um, remember this is the region um, that we were integrating over when we were finding the volume between the two surfaces. So this is a circle, but it's not centered at the origin. Still, it's going to be easier to describe um, in polar coordinates or this region is going to be easier to describe in polar coordinates than it is easy to describe in um, rectangular coordinates. So let's do that. Let's convert this boundary to polar coordinates and then we'll talk about how to get the bounds for r and theta. So first of all, let's write the equation of the circle in rectangular coordinates centered at 0, 1. So this is our form of the equation of a circle in general. You subtract the x-coordinate of the center, which is 0. You subtract the y-coordinate of the center, which is 1. And the radius of that circle is 1, because it's one unit from there to there. So I've got x squared plus the quantity y minus 1 squared equals 1. And if you write this y minus 1 squared twice in FOIL, you get this y times y is y squared, outer times outer is negative y, inner times inner is another negative y, so we get negative 2y. Last times last is 1, and that's great. The 1's reduce if you subtract 1 from both sides, maybe add 2y to both sides as well. <coughs> Say, why am I doing that? Well, because look at this. Now this side has an x squared plus y squared on it, and we know that's very easy to convert to polar coordinates. x squared plus y squared is r squared. And over here, I've got 2 times y. y is r cosine of theta. Or excuse me, r sine of theta. Now normally we don't like to simplify um, a variable from both sides. But this time we can divide by r because look what happens. We get r equals 2 sine of theta. When theta is 0, we get r is 0. So we're right here. So um, this does not prevent r from being 0. This is a simplified version of that. Um, and r can still be 0. So this is how we describe that boundary curve. Instead of calling it x squared plus y squared or y minus 1 squared equals 1, we can describe that boundary this way. So we're going to think of r as starting from here and going out to here. So r is going from the origin out to that curve. Well, at the origin, r is equal to 0. And on that curve, r is equal to 2 sine of theta. Now, theta is an angle that sweeps. Different textbooks do this differently, but I just like to use this intuitive way of thinking about it. Um, I just need to trace out the entire circle, and there are lots of different values of theta, lots of different intervals for theta that will trace this circle out for me. As theta runs through various values, we'll get different points along this circle. The way I like to think of it is I'm still thinking of an angle that sweeps around the xy plane. But here I'm thinking of theta as starting on this side and then going all the way over there. I know it's only, theta is only equal to zero and it's only equal to pi at the single point, but that circle is tangent to the x-axis. So theta is starting here 
it's going through all of these values, and it's ending up over here. So one set of bounds for theta that will work are theta equals zero to theta equals pi, because theta is equal to pi on this side. Okay, so that is one way to describe this. R goes from a function of theta to a function of theta, and theta goes from zero to pi. Now, you might say that's, that's definitely more complicated than the last two, and I absolutely agree, but remember how we described that in rectangular coordinates. We did this in a different video. It was the video on the volume between two surfaces. x went from this square root to this square root, and in order to integrate, we had to complete the squares and switch to, um, or do trigonometric substitution, and y went from zero to two. So I could either integrate with these as my bounds, or I can integrate with this, these as my bounds. R equals two sine of theta isn't that bad, so I'd much rather integrate with these bounds than these bounds. Okay, so now we're going to evaluate that integral from the volume between two surfaces problem um, by switching to uh, polar coordinates. So here is that problem. I actually ran out of time and was unable to finish it in that volume between two surfaces video. My software only allows me to make a video that is one hour long and it cut me off um, or it didn't exactly cut me off, I cut myself off because I realized I wasn't going to be able to finish it in time. I just needed a few more minutes, but it was just a few minutes too long. Um, the, I was, I was going to be over an hour and my, my software would have cut me off. Um, but this is very easy to evaluate the same integral in uh, polar coordinates as opposed to rectangular coordinates. So this was the problem that we were trying to solve. We are asked to find the volume between the elliptic paraboloid 8 minus x squared minus y squared, so that's an elliptic paraboloid facing down, shifted up 8 units, and the plane given by z equals 8 minus 2y. Now that, that plane happens to be a cylinder. It runs parallel to the x-axis. It looks like this line, uh, 2y plus z equals 8 in the yz plane, and it sort of cuts a little part off of the top of that elliptic paraboloid. And if we look at the projection of that volume onto the xy plane, we got this, and that's this region. And we just described that region in polar coordinates in that last example. We said that r was between 0 and 2 sine of theta, and theta goes from here to here, so that's 0 to pi. That's one set of bounds for theta that will trace out that circle for us. <coughs> now in the other video, we said if you want the volume between the two surfaces, you take the equation for the top surface, which is the elliptic paraboloid, and you subtract the equation for the bottom surface. That's this plane, but you had to solve the equation of the plane for z, so you get z equals 8 minus 2y. So this z value minus this plane z value, and you simplify and you got this, and we did a lot of algebra and we got this for our region. Now notice this is going to be much easier to describe in, in um, polar coordinates because this integrand can be written pretty easily in polar coordinates using our coordinate conversion formulas. And these bounds are much nicer and easier to work with than these bounds. Okay, so now we're going we're gonna to practice um, writing, this, writing this integral in polar coordinates rather than rectangular coordinates. There are three things you need to do. First, you need bounds in polar coordinates. So we're finding bounds for the region R in polar coordinates, so that's in terms of R and theta. Normally what we would do is we would sketch the region R, and we did, and then we describe it in polar coordinates. Now when I first saw this problem earlier, I thought, man, it's a circle. I wish I was in the polar coordinates section because then I could just change everything to polar. It would be easier. Um, and then I tried to do it with rectangular coordinates. I ultimately did, but it was really long. Um, 
So anyway, we, we, we look at our region and we say, ah, it's a circle, let's switch to polar. So we switch to polar coordinates, we describe it this way. R goes from a function of theta to a function of theta. So we're going to integrate with respect to R first. And theta goes from a constant to a constant, so that goes on the outside. And then we need to, next we need to write the integrand in polar coordinates. about coordinates, coordinates, there we go. Okay, so f of x, y, in this case, is a negative one times x squared plus y squared plus two y. Well, x squared plus y squared in polar coordinates is just r squared, and two y is two times r sine of theta because y is r sine of theta in polar coordinates. So that is our new integrand. Instead of writing that, you're going to write that. And then dA is not just dr d theta. This was the original dA. You need to replace dA with r dr d theta for the reasons that we talked about in the last video. So this gets replaced by r dr d theta. Okay, so now we have written this integral that was in rectangular coordinates and polar coordinates, and then we just evaluate that. First I'll distribute my r. So we have negative r cubed plus 2r squared sine of theta dr d theta. And then we anti-differentiate. It's just like before any other double integral. We work from the inside out. We anti-differentiate with respect to r. with respect to r. But first we had to simplify that integrand, right? You have to distribute that r from the dA in. And now we're here and we integrate with respect to r. So bring the negative down, add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent. The 2 and the sine of theta are constants, so you can bring those out. The antiderivative of r squared with respect to r, we add 1 to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. And then we replace r with 0 and we replace r with sine of 2 theta and we subtract those. So we end up with negative 1 fourth times 2 sine of theta raised to the fourth. And over here, we've got 2 thirds times sine of theta times 2 sine of theta quantity cubed. And we evaluate all of that at 0 as well, but if r equals 0, that's equal to 0. And we subtract 0, so that doesn't do anything. And the d theta you should bring down. So we anti-differentiate with respect to r, and then we use the fundamental theorem evaluate that at the upper limit and the lower limit and we subtract and now we're here. Now we just have a little bit of algebra to do and then we can integrate with respect to theta. If we take 2 and we raise it to the 4th, that's 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, that's 16. And we're multiplying by sine to the 4th of theta. And over here we've got 2 cubed, so that's 8. 8 times 2 is 16. Over 3, we have sine cubed times another sine, that's going to be another sine to the 4th. 
d theta. And so I've got a sine to the fourth and a sine to the fourth. And we've got 16 over 3 minus, well this simplifies to 4. 4 is the same as 12 over 3. So we end up with 4 thirds, I wrote a 4 there, because I got 4's on the brain. So 4 thirds times the integral from 0 to pi of sine to the fourth of theta d theta. Now, in order to evaluate this, we have to go back to our trig integrals rules from the end, or from calculus two. Um, when we learned about uh, integrating powers of sine and cosine, we had a guideline that said, if the powers of sine or cosine in your problem are all even and non-negative, use your power reducing formulas. So that's what we'll do here. Instead of writing that as sine to the fourth, I'm going to write that as a sine squared times sine squared. And we can do that because it's really four sines multiplying each other. So I could just do two, two of them multiplying and two of them multiplying. And then I use my power reducing formulas. Sine squared of theta turns out to be one half of one minus cosine of double the angle. That angle was theta. Now I've got a 2 theta. And this is the same. It's going to be 1 half of 1 minus cosine of 2 theta. We're integrating with respect to theta. 1 half times 1 half is 1 fourth. And 1 fourth times the 4 thirds is going to give us a 1 third out front. And we can do that because we multiply in any order we want. So we're just factoring out all the constants and multiplying them together to get this. And then when we distribute this times this, we get 1 minus uh, 2, so 1 times 1 is 1, then we're going to have negative cosine of 2 theta minus cosine of 2 theta, so that's minus 2 cosine of 2 theta, plus cosine times cosine is cosine squared of 2 theta. Now this piece requires a power reducing formula as well, because it's cosine to an even power and I don't have a sine multiplying it, so I can't use a u sub. Um, cosine squared of an angle is one half of one plus cosine of double the angle. This time the angle is two theta, so when I double it, I'll get a four theta there. And of course you could distribute that one half and call that one half plus one half cosine of four theta. And that one plus that one half is three halves. Okay, I know we did a lot of similar work when we were doing our trig substitution, um, but this is gonna be easier because we'll just be able to evaluate this at zero and pi and subtract. So now we can anti-differentiate with respect to theta. The antiderivative of a constant with respect to theta is that constant times theta. Here we bring the two down. And remember, the antiderivative of cosine is sine. But if you have a kx inside or a k times your variable inside, when you differentiate, you have to multiply by that variable or that multiply by that constant. So I would have to multiply by two if I was taking the derivative. When I'm taking the antiderivative, I have to divide by that two. And I bring the one half down, antiderivative of cosine is sine of the angle, and since there's a constant inside, I have to divide by that constant. It's kind of a shortcut for a u substitution. If u is equal to 4 theta, du would be 4 d theta, so we'd have 1 fourth du equals d theta. And that is our antiderivative, it's a definite integral. So we substitute in 0 and pi and subtract. So we get, if I distribute the one-third, one-half of theta minus one-third of sine of two theta plus one-eighth of sine of four theta. Let's substitute in zero and pi and subtract. At pi, we get pi over two, 
and sine of 2 pi is 0, sine of 4 pi is also 0. When we substitute in 0 here, we have 0, sine of 0, and sine of 0, so everything goes to 0. So we find out the volume is pi over 2, which is exactly the same value we got um, without switching to polar coordinates. Now there was a lot of calculation involved, but my goodness, this was much, much easier than what we did before when we were in rectangular coordinates. There was completing the square, and there was a trig substitution, and as part of the trig substitution, we had to use trig integration. And then at the end of the trig integration, you would have to back substitute. And it was, it was involved, so involved, that I could not show you the whole example in a one one-hour video. But in this one, I was able to do several examples of describing regions and polar coordinates and get through the whole problem and show you the answer um, pretty easily just by switching to polar coordinates. Um, so again, you look at something like this. You say, look at that region R. As soon as I see that region R as part of a circle, I'm saying, let's switch to polar. What do you do to switch to polar? You write your bounds in polar coordinates, first by sketching the region and then describing it in polar coordinates. You need an integrand in polar coordinates. So you replace this with whatever it would be in terms of r and theta. So you replace x squared plus y squared with r squared, replace y with r sine theta, and if there were any x's, I would replace them with r cosine theta. And then dA gets replaced by r dr d theta. And after you substitute and after you distribute, you end up right here, and then you just evaluate the integral. You start on the innermost integral and you work your way out. And it did take a little bit of work, but it wasn't nearly as bad as it would have been, or as it was, um, in um, rectangular coordinates. So I think I'm going to do another example of this in another video, um, but that's the gist. That's how we switch um, from having a double integral in rectangular coordinates and then writing it and then evaluating it in polar coordinates.